symposium. Vilnius is a place of history. We have a very distinguished panel of historians. Um, I will, uh, well, you have the, the program in front of you. I will just read their names, but I will introduce each of them uh, separately, and we'll start with Professor Venslova. The panel, uh, as you see, uh, includes Professor Emeritus Thomas Venslova of Yale University, Professor Theodore Weeks of Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, mm -hmm. Professor Darius Dalionis, Lithuanian Institute of History, and Professor Violeta Davila Lute, Vilnius University and the Univers Lithuanian Institute of History. Uh, my name is Bradley Woodworth, and I am I will moderate this panel. Professor Venslova was born in distant Klaipeda, Lithuania on the Baltic Sea. And I'm reading the text here that was published um, just several years ago upon uh, Professor Venslova's re uh, retirement. And it's addressed to him by Pen uh, Penelope Lawrence uh, uh, of Yale University. And so she's speaking to him about his life and thanking him for everything he's done for Yale University. You, Thomas Venslova, are one of Europe's greatest living poets a brilliant literary, literary specialist and teacher of Russian and Polish literature, a leading figure in the camp of East European descent, a staunch defender of human rights throughout the world, and for many, the very conscience of your native Lithuania. Your publications in the field of culture and politics have long resonated with writers, scholars, journalists, and human rights activists on both sides of the Atlantic. A recipient of five honorary degrees, and winter, winner of numerous international awards, you have written magisterial poetry that has been translated into more than 20 languages. And your meticulous, meticulous analysis of East European poets has provided an invaluable foray into the place of the literary bard in the nation. Whether as poet, literary scholar, or essayist, you have always focused on the entangled relationship between culture and politics and the dangers of chauvinism or sectarianism of any kind. You have adopted a unique posture with respect to the question of nationalism and never lapsed into extremes or shied away from the terrible cost of any form of totalitarianism. With unparalleled moral depth, you have eloquently declared that if the choice is between nation and truth, you choose truth. Almost alone among the writers of your native land, you have movingly exposed the tragedy of Lithuania, acknowledging the responsibility of those who participated in the extermination of their Jewish countrymen. Raised in a, power, in a family of power and prestige, your courage and high moral purpose have brought you much controversy and difficulty in your native land. For your actions on behalf of freedom, you fell into disfavor and were denounced, suspended from the university, threatened with forced confinement in a psychiatric hospital, but your voice was never stilled, and your determination to tell the truth never wavered. Your eloquent voice is where the three great European cultures of Lithuania, Poland, and Russia meet. Together with Nobel Prize winning poets Czesław Miłosz and Joseph Broski, you have formed a mighty literary triumvirate, defending the glory of your native tradition from the perspective of a cosmopolitan exile. Your books, essays, and I brought just one here that has been referred to already today, your books, essays, and prefaces give a resounding testimony to both the desolate landscape in the aftermath of totalitarianism and the ethical cons constants that allow us to preserve and to hope. At, at, as at home with the great Polish bards, as with the major Russian poets, you have devoted yourself to succeeding generations of students here at Yale University who have been dazzled by your encyclopedic knowledge of both literary traditions and from which we will benefit today. For you, your beloved Vilnius has become the eternal city that is transformed by the intersecting themes of memory, nostalgia, and identity into the great multicultural and multi-ethnic Lithuanian Vilnius, Polish Vilnius, and Jewish Vilnius. Professor Vanslova, thank you very much for coming back to Yale. Ladies and gentlemen, I have prepared a sort of a talk about the so-called Vilnius text as a nostalgic text. Uh, it is admissible to claim that any city has its own language. 
that means that it speaks to us through its topography, climate, and, and architecture, as well as through the corpus of works of art that relate to its history and fate. This language can be rather limited and even embryonic, or it can be extremely rich and multifaceted, as in the case of Rome, Paris, Dublin, or Prague. But in principle, in any case, it can be reconstructed on the basis of a totality of heterogeneous texts representing, in the sense of Ferdinand de Saussure, a kind of speech of the city. When talking about the speech, one usually confines oneself to the verbal realm, both artistic and documentary. But from a wider perspective, it can include nonverbal text as well. Above all, architecture, which is in a way um, the substratum of, of any speech of the city, as well as painting, music, photography, film, and even the individual fates of the city's residents. In short, anything that shapes the city's aura and mythology and registers it in the cultural memory as a unique and symbolic role. Alongside the rather problematic concept of the text of the city, one may and should use such categories as the city's mythopoetics or simply the, city, the city's poetics. Let me mention a few typical features of the Vilnius text. Uh, one, Vilnius has always been situated on the border between different political and cultural worlds, conventionally speaking, the, on the border between the West and the East. And this border would often move. As a result, the city would find itself on either the Western or the Eastern sides of the border. Two, Vilnius usually appears to be an ethnic enclave. Thus, in the 18th and 19th centuries, its population consisted mainly of Poles and Jews, while Lithuanian and Belarusian were spoken in the surrounding villages. Mm. By the way, the well-known or maybe notorious politician of the early 20th century, Lloyd George, uh, said once that Vilnius is a city inhabited by Jews and Belarusians, and the city fought over uh, by Poles and, and Lithuanians. And he also proposed to um, remove all the inhabitants from the city and, uh, and uh, transform it into a museum. As, as the only way of uh, solving the problem of this uh, too complicated uh, place. Now the situation has become inverted. The population of the city is mainly Lithuanian, to some degree also Russian, while the surrounding villages speak mainly Polish and less frequently Belarusian. Now the situation is complicated uh, even more because of thousands and thousands of uh, recent Belarusian, Ukrainian, and also Russian refugees. Uh, three, the Vilnius text is essentially multicultural and polyglot. No particular language or culture can claim to have played the lead role here. This feature makes Vilnius similar to Prague, Trieste, Lvov or Lvov or Lviv, Chernovtsi, and to an extent also with uh, Liga and Tallinn. Four, the Vilnius text is almost always nostalgic. It is uh, usually created by people cut off from their city as a result of historical cataclysms and therefore especially sensitive to the details of its topography and everyday life. Well, more about that later. Mm, five, the same person can belong to, to, to several cult cultures, which sometimes results 
in an inner con conflict. Six, for all these reasons, Vilnius is often defined as an eccentric, strange, mysterious, that is myth-generating city, which assists the creation of poetry. Vilnius, however, is an opposite of uh, another uh, strange and mysterious city of Eastern Europe, namely Petersburg, because it is neither artificial nor ideated. On the contrary, it grows naturally from its soil. And seven, in general, the Vilnius text is oriented to the mythic model of the world, which emphasizes the extratemporal and cyclic origins rather than the temporal and linear ones, regularity rather than incident, repetition than rather, rather than episodic occurrences, uh, the eternal cycle of death and resurrection um, as, as opposed to, to history. I will try to illustrate it using concrete examples. So, I can speak a bit, I should speak a bit about the Lithuanian poet, Juozas Kekštas. Kekštas is a pseudonym meaning J. He was a pupil of a Lithuanian high school of in the interwar period. Many students of that school embraced radical worldviews, including communism. One schoolmate of Kekštas took part in the assassination of Leo Trotsky. As a teenager, Kekštas was incarcerated in the notorious Lukishke or Lukishke's prison. When out of prison, he made friends with members of the Polish literary group Zagary. Czeslav Milos was among them. Uh, to make things more complicated, Zagary is not a Polish but a Lithuanian word, which refers to rough, dry sticks used for setting a fire. So, well, uh, let me um, tell for those who don't know it that Lithuanian and Polish differ as much as Gaelic and English. Uh, Lithuanian is totally incompre incomprehensible for any Polish or Russian speaker without a prolonged study. Mm. In 1939, the year the Soviet army seized Vilnius and the city was transferred to Lithuania, Kekštas was 24. The young radical did not want to stay in a virtuous country, so he moved to Belarus, then part of the Soviet state. Predictably, he was soon arrested and sent to a labor camp. During the Soviet-German war, Kekštas was released, joined Polish army, and reached Italy via the Middle East. He was the only, only, he was the only one Lithuanian known to me who entered Rome as a soldier of the victorious Allied forces. Uh, unable to return to either Lithuania or Poland, he eventually left for Buenos Aires. He continued to write poetry, founded a Lithuanian avant-garde journal, and published a collection of his translations of Milos. Then, uh, while working on a highway, he suffered a stroke and was paralyzed. With the help of old acquaintances, Kekštas moved to Warsaw. Mm, I was lucky enough to meet him there, but uh, for a very short uh, moment, by the way. As one Polish scholar rightly puts it, Kekštas was always different and could never adjust anywhere. He believed in communist ideas, but became disillusioned with them. A Lithuanian, he fought in the Polish army. A leftist from Vilnius, he remained an outcast in exile. He spent the last years of his life close to Lithuania, to which he could not or maybe would not return. The most interesting part of this literary oeuvre uh, is uh, we, we, we find it in his Warsaw letters to an old female friend, a resident of Vilnius. 
these letters are mainly descriptions of his imaginary walks around the city. This is pre-war Vilnius. Old street names, obsolete shops, restaurants and theaters, signboards, shop windows and posters that are no longer there, but remain alive and catch this as memory. It gives the most precise topographic directions. This is the corner at which to turn, this is the direction to take, this how much time we shall need, and so on. So, according to Milos, a resident of Vilnius is neither Lithuanian, nor Polish, nor Belarusian. I would su suggest that he or she should be in some ways reminiscent of Kekštas, Lithuanian poet, Polish soldier, and Russian prisoner to boot. At this point, one should remember uh, also more prominent personalities. For instance, Adam Mickiewicz, Czeslaw Milos, or even Romain Gary. Nostalgia affects, by the way, not only individuals, but entire ethnic and national groups. All those features of the Vilnius' text emerged slowly. The first inhabitant of the city were Lithuanians, a non-Slavic Baltic tribe, though as early as Middle Ages, the city abounded in Slavic people. It is the 14th century Lithuanian narrative written in East Slavic language about the founding of the city that sacralizes Vilnius and defines its future as the indubitable capital of the Lithuanian state. This is the so-called legend of Gedemina's dream, which echoes throughout the Vilnius text up to our own times, sometimes obtaining ironic and grotesque traits, but more often retaining its mythic dimension. There is a vast corpus of professional literature of the Renaissance of the Baroque eras dedicated to the city, written with, by the authors of various ethnic origin, mainly in Latin. In it, Vilnius is placed on a par with Rome, Troy, and Jerusalem as a city of extraordinary fate and of great promise. In 1610, Jan Eisimond wrote in Polish a poetic text about Vilnius destroyed by the fire, the first text about the death of the Lithuanian capital. Here, purely physical one, but already with characteristic nostalgic motifs. After the partitions of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the motif of spiritual death and resurrection became, became prevalent. For Adam Mickiewicz, a political exile, the city had basically ceased to exist, or rather was murdered, like the rest of the country. But both the city and the country appeared to be destined for a revival, which would presage and become the beginning of the eschatological renewal of the world. In his text, Mitzkevich, as well as another significant poet of the period, Julius Slavatsky, does not mention Vilnius frequently, but the city remains an invisible center of attraction, a black hole around which the entire Polish Romantic movement revolves. Already the earliest and somewhat undervalued Mitzkevich's poem, Winter in the City, was heartily, spice, heartily spiced up with humorous details. In his mature work, including a long epic Pantadeus, he developed a nostalgic myth of Lithuania. Mm, he had in mind rather, Belora, rather Belarus than Lithuania. He was born on the Belarusian terrains, but called them Lithuania. He developed a nostalgic myth of Lithuania, which abounded in particular pieces of information and topographical notions, and became a poetic paradigm for generations to come. A similar pattern can be traced in the 20th century works of Czeslaw Milos, even if he is polemical towards the Polish nationalism and messianism. 
An emigre poet is cut off from the city by the Soviet occupation. Vilnius or Vilno undergoes a perhaps temporary death and even loses its name. This is the title of Miloš's book of 1969, City Without a Name. Miloš recreates the city spaces in the Proustian manner. Vilnius is idealized because of physical and temporal distance, but the picture is realistic enough and devoid of sentimentality. The poems written after the restoration of freedom in Eastern Europe, when Miloš could return to his native lands, present Vilnius or Vilno as a realm of the dead and Lithuania as some other space described in metaphysical categories but they still abound in unique details and specific topography. Miloš established a paradigm for the so-called literature of Kresy, the eastern provinces of the old Poland, although he did not approve of the term. That literature, marked by names of Józef Mackiewicz, Tadeusz Konwicki, and many others, exhibits the main feature of the Vilnius text, a link with the cat category of the border and that of an enclave, the dialogue of languages and cultures, ambiguous identity of, of the characters, and, and, and so on. Another variant of the nostalgic Vilnius text has developed in Lithuanian language. When the city in 1920 was annexed to Poland, the Lithuanian political class and intellectuals found this impossible to come to terms with. Most of the Lithuanian writers moved to Kaunas, and the period saw the emergence of the so-called Vilnius literature, a straightforward expression of the nostalgia for the lost capital. In this literature, Vilnius was a symbol of Lithuanian identity, construed as sacred and mythologized city simultaneously pagan, represented by the Gediminas' castle, and Christian, represented by the holy gate of Ausros Varte, or Ostra Brahma in Polish. Its resurrection from temporary death or lethargy had a strictly political dimension, namely its, its reestablishment as the capital of the independent Lithuania, which happened in 1939. Then, several decades of the Soviet rule followed. The challenge of continuing the text of Vilnius was undertaken by the younger generation. Now the resurrection of the city meant primarily its integration into the body of native, non-Soviet Lithuanian culture. I'll mention two, only two of the most significant names of that period. Judita Vajcunaiti wrote poems in a rather traditional style, creating a Vilnius Bedecker, a description of its streets, parks, and squares, with many references to historical figures and different local groups. And Jurgis Kunchinas, both writers are unfortunately not with us anymore, Jurgis Kunchinas in his novels reconstructed Vilnius in a rather similar vein, Joyce did for Dublin. The city's crossroads and nooks, the scarred bridges and weeds of the Uzupis region were depicted with fascinating precision. There are books on Vilnius or, or chapters within them in Russian, French, German, and so on. But first of all, one must mention text, text in Hebrew or Yiddish. For several centuries, Jews conceived of Vilnius or Vilne as a second Jerusalem, the center of spiritual aristocracy and the location of Shtetl Boys Bildungsroman. Not only was Jewish Vilne a metaphor or metonymy for ancient Jerusalem, but alas repeated its destiny, having been turned into ruins and becoming a place for mourning. All that was described by Avrom Sutskever, Chaim Grade, and many, uh, many others. Even Mark Chagall wrote a poem for Vilnius. 
They made a nostalgic farewell to the city, never to be resurrected, each of their own compelling way. Belarusians, too, bid farewell to Vilnius. Their national movement, one of the youngest ones in Europe, sprouted in the city. The coat of arms of non-Lukashenko's Belarus is identical to the Lithuanian one, and its anthem by the early 20th century poet Maxim Bogdanovich speaks about the Holy Gate in Vilnius. The contemporary Belarusian intelligentsia is probably tormented by, by even strong, stronger nostalgia for Vilnius than the Polish intelligentsia. Let's, let's hope this would not generate serious political conflicts, especially if Lithuanians are considered towards Belarusian cultural legacy. Regardless of the dreams of a national homogeneity, the Lithuanian capital has remained what it ha had always been, complex and multidimensional, a continent in miniature. But this is a fr fragile condition. Vilnius has gone through many cri crises. It has often changed state affiliation, the composition of its inhabitants, and its cultural patterns. Now it again has the status it held 700 years ago. It is the center of a young country that is ready to meet the challenge of Europe. At the same time, the old type of a Lithuanian who belongs to several cultures simultaneously may probably be revived, at least in some cases. And maybe this will no longer cause any inner conflicts. The creation of Europe and European civilization has always been an uncertainty and a risk. I don't know of any place in Europe that better lives up to this, to this risk than Vilnius, a perpetual peripheral area and borderland, an eccentric, capricious, erratic city with a unique past that violates all the rules of logic and probability, a past that is always longed for. Thank you. Professor Venslova, thank you very much. And uh, we will have some time at the end of this panel for questions um, and uh, discussion. But let me go forward with uh, our next speaker, Theodore Weeks uh, from Southern Illinois University. Um, he, is a he has been a distinguished Fulbright professor at the University of Warsaw. Among his works are Nation and State in Late Imperial Russia, Nationalism and Russification on the Western Frontier, 1863-1914, uh, assimilation to anti-Semitism, the Jewish question in Poland, and uh, most recently, Vilnius Between Nations, 1795 to 2000. His research interests include nationalism, ethnic relations, anti-Semitism, and more recently, the history of technology. And presently, he is at work on a history of radio, radio in interwar Poland. So, that's so, weeks.
It's coming in a moment, okay. or maybe in two, <laughs> but definitely in three moments. So just. Yosh. Okay. All right. Tell me when you see it. <laughs> I feel like I have to stand on my head to give this uh, this talk. No, three minutes. Emails are coming in. Okay. Let me check out. Did we see something? Or was it something else? Ah, World Ford. Okay, va va. <laughs> and that will be my talk today. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so uh, I always say that the main purpose of PowerPoint is to, uh, pedagogically speaking, is to show how PowerPoint should not be used under any circumstances. So I hope I will not contribute to that. A discussion. So uh, there's the famous picture uh, that, you know, maybe, um, I don't know if the front lights could be dimmed uh, to avoid um, uh, glare, but we're not going into that. Um, so um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is sort of, this has obviously been touched on by uh, much better and distinguished people uh, than I, uh, but why spend um, years uh, studying this uh, this country and learning, um, uh, trying to learn at least the hellish um, uh, Lithuanian grammar um, uh, when, you know, you could be doing Sevilla and, uh, and drinking uh, wine and, and uh, having warm weather. Um, although Vilnius weather is, someone said bad things about it. It's not that bad, actually. Um, I will just <laughs> throw in. Um, well, uh, I, I will argue that the level of diversity in Vilnius um, is, is pretty unique. I think also one of the reasons why there is this, uh, could say, concert between different ethnicities and cultures and languages is that for most of at least the modern period, which is I'm a modernist, then the 19th and 20th century, um, until, well, actually not, not just until after World War II, but all the way into the 80s, there is not one group that is the majority in Vilnius. And I think that that creates a situation where um, different uh, ethnic groups are kind of jockeying around, they're co cooperating at least on some uh, level with, uh, uh, with the others uh, because one group cannot um, completely dominate. Um, so uh, uh, again, uh, this has been mentioned, the um, uh, Yerushalayim Delita, uh, and here we have um, the on the, the Yiddish text on the um, on uh, your uh, left, uh, I guess it is, um, that shows the old uh, synagogue that was uh, very much uh, damaged during World War II, but but not completely. The, the the walls were still there, and the communists blew it up um, again. Uh, to uh, one of the things that uh, the post-war uh, period excelled in is to try to. I would say erase history. Maybe that's a little too harsh, but I don't think so. Um, uh, in any case, to um, uh, monitor history, which is uh, states do that. They're still doing that. Um, uh, but uh, in any case, that's why you should have historians who are not dependent on those uh, states for their salary uh, to um, uh, comment on them. Uh, there is a there was a National Geographic special uh, or a special. Uh, report, I think 1938, 
um, uh, that I scanned these um, images from. So on the one hand, we have Catholic, uh, uh, both Catholic and also very Polish, um, uh, Vilnius on the, uh, on the left-hand side. And we have this, um, you can see the, uh, <laughs> the uh, white eagle, um, but you can also see Zeit uh, here in Yiddish. Um, uh, there's a, 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 um, a Russian uh, language or maybe Belarusian uh, um, and the, uh, uh, just because this is for Americans, uh, uh, Vilna uh, reads in many languages. Um, of course, we have, and this is a contemporary uh, more or less uh, picture uh, the uh, Orthodox uh, community, um, and of course, religion is much more important than language um, or the concept of nationality is not, um, it's not a legal category in the, um, in the Russian Empire, um, which makes it difficult for the Russian Empire where they want to repress certain nationalities. They don't have a way that they, the Soviets made it a legal category, and so it was easier. Um, so, but religion was a legal category. Everyone had to have a religion in the Russian Empire. Um, and of course, uh, Vilnius was part of the Russian was, um, uh, Empire in uh, the 19th century. Um, and one of the things that the uh, Russian Empire does is to, to try to mark the city um, and specific uh, places with uh, Orthodox um, churches and also to, uh, to make the argument that it's really an Orthodox, um, i.e. Russian, um, city uh, that's just kind of lost its way and become contaminated with poles, et cetera. Um, you can also look at the cityscape um, and you can actually tell a lot of history by looking at, uh, essentially this is, this uh, is not the best um, uh, map because it's uh, so far out. If you, if you had a closer in and you could see the old, um, the old city uh, more, uh, Closely, you could see even more the streets, uh, the distinction between the, um, uh, the straight uh, line streets, uh, such as uh, what on this map is Lenino, uh, still uh, here, that goes from uh, present day parliament uh, to uh, the cathedral, or uh, in those days, it was a um, uh, portrait gallery. Um, uh, so these are 19th century um, uh, streets uh, and and were usually talked about, even a lot of people of different ethnicities uh, lived there, but as Russian. Um, so uh, this was, uh, again, a way of um, the Russian and modern in the 19th century. Um, we can also approach the, and I'm just kind of taking topics here, you know, a couple of historical points and then um, uh, uh, turn this over to more, uh, to more competent uh, historians. Uh, but uh, architecture, uh, obviously, and art history, um, my, um, I think a lot of uh, nostalgia um, uh, of these, uh, uh, these uh, very campy uh, statues that were on the Green Bridge um, that I remember one year um, in, in Lithuanian uh, period that they put uh, tall um, Santa hats on them. And then even better um, to make this postmodern, someone stole them all uh, in the middle of the night. Um, but uh, just in time for my book to come out, the um, uh, mayor of Vilnius decided to that this was uh, Soviet um, uh, you know, the repression and terrible, and, and they were um, cleared away um, to be replaced, by, at least for a certain point, uh, by um, <laughs> automobile uh, show uh, show cars um, uh, for which uh, undoubtedly someone was paying for. But um, uh, these, um, uh, so from the uh, sublime uh, to the ridiculous, um, a famous uh, monastery also that um, was a unit uh, monastery and then um, forced to become Orthodox uh, in those uh, repressions of the Soviet uh, Russian Empire at the end of the 19th century. We can also approach the city through social history, uh, which a bit has been done uh, lately. A lot more could be done. Um, I think most, in, in including, uh, I, I did not do a very good job of that. Uh, my interests are um, elsewhere. Um, economic history, uh, which we have a pretty good number of uh, texts uh, on. But um, as several people have mentioned, this is a big, the Vilnius as a city is an uh, economic uh, center. Uh, as well, and this is one of the reasons, uh, not the only one or the main one, but one of the reasons um, that uh, Lithuania claimed uh, the city uh, in the interwar saying, you know, 
it's it's the economic center for this for this region, which is mainly Lithuania, even if the uh, population of the city in the interwar is small. And of course, cultural history. And I give you um, the, these uh, book uh, uh, sellers, which of course when uh, Lithuanian not be uh, printed in uh, uh, Latin letters uh, within uh, the Russian Empire. Uh, these booksellers, um, probably not this one, but some were Jewish, um, uh, bringing the, uh, uh, the text across from um, uh, from East Prussia, where um, uh, Lithuania could be published and, and was printed actually both in Gothic and in, uh, that is in Hatua and in, um, in Latin. And this uh, famous um, a uh, wonderful Soviet building that's still there, the uh, scientist's house that was uh, built uh, on the uh, Nevis very specifically on the post-World uh, War II period to um, encourage Lithuanian, uh, Lithuanian Soviet science, but it was very much Lithuanian as well as Soviet, um, which is sometimes um, forgotten. Um, so uh, here we are. Uh, with uh, Smigli uh, Vids uh, in uh, the uh, early 20s, uh, claiming and Poland uh, claiming the uh, uh, the city as theirs, and um, I mentioned since um, re referred to this, but the um, uh, World War uh, II, one of the most uh, tragic and the most disruptive, both architecturally, but even more, far more. Uh, for the population that, um, uh, of course, uh, the Jewish population is pretty much wiped out. Um, and uh, the, uh, then uh, when the uh, Red Army comes in in 1944, they, um, only a few Jews are coming out of, of hiding. And these are some of uh, the uh, pictures of uh, the uh, Nemetskaya. Uh, uh, so uh, it is Vokechu again. Um, but in Soviet days, uh, it was um, Museum Street. But again, the Soviet um, effort to forget about uh, the past um, uh, or certain aspects of the past. And certainly the Soviets, uh, as a um, Jewish friend of mine in Leningrad many years ago said, um, uh, and I, I think that's perfectly put um, that let's, uh, we'd rather not uh, think about Jews, they confuse the issue and, and um, they don't fit in our rubric particularly well. And then there's Trotsky um, and uh, et cetera. Um, so, um, and finally, um, I, I'm, I'm really glad to have next to me my, my wonderful friend, Violetta, who is um, writing about the uh, post 1945 uh, period in a really serious and interesting way, because I think that that um, tends to be uh, neglected, this uh, period. This is a period of Lithuanian history and of Lithuanian culture, and um, I mean, one of the most uh, distinguished um, uh, representatives um, and the son of one of the most distinguished uh, representatives of this, uh, sitting to my left. Uh, so, uh, uh, and um, since this also has been, I, I, I would agree with the, uh, I'm glad that it was, that Lenin was uh, taken away. Uh, but uh, just again, historians are, um, I think if historians are doing their job, um, they would be arrested in Florida because historians should make you feel uncomfortable. Should, historians should make you be thinking about things and putting things together that uh, you might not have otherwise. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you. Uh, next is Professor Doug. He is chief researcher at the Lithuanian Institute of History and project leader of genealogy of conflict in modernizing society, the case of Lithuania, a project that is ongoing for, for the next several years, and teaches at Vilnius University. His academic interests include uh, nationality policies in what in the Russian Empire was called the Northwest, uh, Northwestern region, including Lithuania and Belarus, ethnic conflicts, problems of historiography, and places of memory in Lithuania. Among his many uh, publications are he mentions here, or I'll mention just uh, uh, several. He's the author of uh, Making Russians Meaning and Practice of Russification in Lithuania and Belarus uh, after 1863, 
Enemies for a Day, Anti-Semitism and Anti-Jewish Violence in Lithuania under the Tsars. And uh, more recently, with Dangiris Machulis, Nationalism and the Vilnius Question, 1883 to 1940. And here I just picked up Yell's. Uh, so Yell's got it in both languages. Uh, and so thank you very much. And Darius, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Brad, for a kind introduction and uh, for inviting me to this uh, uh, conference and for a possibility to speak in such a distinguished uh, uh, panel. <clears throat> when you invite a historian, you should know that he is going to complicate things. And I'll, I'll do my best uh, uh, to complicate uh, the nice story uh, of the city of Vilnius. What I am going to talk about today is uh, the situation in the late imperial uh, period, uh, meaning uh, end of 19, beginning of the 20th century, and the situation uh, of Vilnius, Vilnius as a microcosm of uh, ethnic relations uh, in Lithuania at that time. And that was a crucial period uh, in the history of Vilnius, uh, the history of Lithuania and the region uh, in a broader sense, because that was the period when uh, modern nationalism uh, started to shape uh, the city and, uh, and uh, the region. Uh, so at the beginning of the 20th century, in a more broader context, Vilnius was a provincial city, stagnant in economic sense and hardly distinguishable in cultural sense. I should just remind you that there was no institution of higher education in the city for, for many decades. However, both in terms of its functions, the center of governor generalship, its symbolic significance, and its role as the largest urban center in the region, Vilnius was at the heart of the cultural and political life of quite a broad region on the Western borderlands of the Russian Empire. Events and processes in the city were a reflection of those in the wider region, so as I said, a kind of microcosm. The image of Vilnius as a city uh, were interesting experiments in intercultural, interconfessional, or interethnic cooperation have taken place is not without foundation. In the first part of this paper, I will try to discuss those cases where activists of different nationalities uh, living in Vilnius have made plans for the common future or have cooperated in various forms. Then I will try to explain the reasons for such cooperation or for making such plans. And uh, shortly, I will talk about durability of uh, these forms of cooperation. The next uh, part of the paper will be devoted to discussing those situations in which confrontation between uh, different ethnic groups in Vilnius became apparent. In this paper, I argue that the interests of various national groups in Vilnius regarding the political future of the city and the region were of confrontational nature and that they did not take the form of a bitter conflict, primarily because the city and the region were part of an authoritarian state, the Russian Empire. So the image of Vilnius as a city where different ethnic and confessional groups coexist peacefully was reinforced by the fact that as far as is known, there was not a single anti-Jewish pogrom during the whole uh, long 19th century. There were pogroms all around the region, uh, in Minsk, uh, Belistok, Kiev, etc., but none in Vilnius. However, the image of a peaceful coexistence of different ethnic groups in the historical capital of Lithuania can be illustrated not only by the example of the absence of pogroms, but also by the various forms of cooperation between the activists uh, who represented various nationalities. So the best known example, of course, is the Krajowcy movement. Uh, so the small group of uh, Polish speaking intellectuals who identified, politically identified with Lithuania. Uh, 
strangely enough, uh, currently there is more literature on this small group than on, uh, for example, Lithuanian national movement or Polish national movement in Lithuania or Belarusian national movement uh, in Lithuania. So there is now a huge literature on Krajowcy, Michal <coughs> Romer, and um, others. Um, during the 1905 revolution, uh, Polish and Lithuanian leaders agreed, for example, to establish the free university in the city, a private higher education institution. The initiators' declarations stated that this university should meet the needs of all the nationalities in the region, and the teaching uh, should be in Polish, Lithuanian, and Russian, or Belarusian. There were also examples of uh, cooperation among artists, and of course, uh, many uh, cases when political activists met and uh, planned uh, a common future uh, for this territory. For example, in late uh, 1915, a proclamation was signed in Vilnius in Polish, Lithuanian, Belarusian, and Yiddish which announced the creation of separate uh, state of Lithuania and uh, Belarus. So what were the causes of cooperation and uh, how about the durability of this uh, phenomena? The answer to the question of why there were no uh, anti-Jewish pogroms uh, in Vilnius during the entire imperial period must begin with an explanation why such a question is legitimate at all. So I think there are two reasons why we can discuss such a question. First of all, uh, as I mentioned, uh, anti-Jewish as well as anti-Semitic sentiments were quite strong uh, in, in the Lithuanian society at the time. Secondly, as I mentioned as well, anti-Jewish pogroms took place in similar uh, cities, uh, in the Jewish Pale of Settlement and also in the Kingdom of Poland. So why Vilnius was a pogrom-free uh, city? I think several factors can be pointed to as having contributed to this uh, situation. In the Russian Empire, many pogroms took, took place during 1905 revolution, when groups loyal to the Tsarist uh, regime took uh, to the streets of the cities to defend the emperor against the Jews and revolutionaries. Poles, but especially Lithuanians, were revolutionaries as well. So there was no need to punish Jews as revolu revolutionaries when you are yourself belong to the same uh, group. Another reason relates to the economic backwardness uh, of the region as a whole, which reduced the scope of interconfessional competition in the labor market and the corresponding ethnic conflicts. The later thesis can be complemented by Ilya Gerasimov's identification of Vilnius as a patriarchal city. A patriarchal metropolis, Gerasimov's term, is a stagnant city in which the plebeian urban community has not yet been influenced by modern ideologies and is characterized not by ghettoization, but by mutual intermingling. People's behavior in Vilnius were self-regulated through the social practices, not public discourses. End quote. Uh, and here you see uh, a kind of connection with what uh, Christina Sabalevskaita said, uh, quoting uh, late David Frick's study on Vilnius in the 17th century, when we see the same very similar situation uh, with regards to inter ethnic uh, relations. The reasons behind the cases of cooperation between actors of different ethnic groups just discussed were varied. Sometimes, as for example, between Jewish and Lithuanian social democrats, there was a great deal of commonality of old view, but there were more important factors to that. Another important reason was the search for allies in the struggle against the main enemies. 
This motive was at work most often, and usually that enemy before and even during First World War was the uh, government of the Russian Empire. But in other cases, uh, that cooperation was triggered because the main enemy was a different one, like for Jews and Lithuanians, uh, that uh, enemy uh, were Poles. It's important to note that these episodes of cooperation were usually of conjunctural nature, short term, a kind of marriage of convenience. The free university was not established in Vilnius. The changing political regime in the Romanov Empire was, of course, a very important reason for preventing the implementation of this idea. But the discussion of the idea in the Vilnius press at the time clearly showed that the possibility of establishing such a university was remote. The Lithuanians gave priority to a Lithuanian national university and Poles for the Polish one. The proclamations about the common aspirations of Lithuanians, Poles, Belarusians, and Jews to create Lithuanian and Belarusian state which appeared in Vilnius, as I mentioned, in late 1915 and early 1916, were most likely the result of a short conjecture in the context of the plans being discussed by the German occupational authorities. It seems that Jewish um, activists didn't sign the document at all, and the other signatories uh, didn't have the authority to represent any organization. Those, these episodes of cooperation between various national actors at the beginning of the 20th century show that the active part of the society was already divided into national groups. This is why Vilnius in the late imperial period was so strongly characterized by rivalries and conflicts between different national groups. And I will discuss it now shortly. The fact that a large number of public organiza organizations, especially those involved in cultural and educational affairs were organized on a national basis was like a natural phenomenon, given that these activities had to be conducted in one of the national languages. However, it's important to know that these activities often gave rise to ethnic conflicts, indicating the existence of serious conflicts between activists claiming to represent one or another national group. These conflicts arose even when it seemed necessary to join forces for a common cause. One such situation uh, concerned Gediminas Castle Hill, uh, which was already mentioned today, or Gura Zamkova in Polish. To put long story short, uh, not only did Lithuanians and Poles not cooperate with each other when the city council decided to put a water reservoir on that hill, but this issue became a battlefield between them. Lithuanian activists, especially those around the Lithuanian Scientific Society, sought to use the story as an element of anti-Polish propaganda. Lithuanian public figures blamed the Poles for this barbaric action and argued that the remains of the Gediminas castle and the hill itself were the property of the Lithuanian nation. This conflict was related to the symbolic appropriation of the city, but at the beginning of the 20th century, Vilnius was also a scene of other ethnic conflicts. Conflicts over the language of supplementary services in Catholic churches attracted a lot of attention in the press of the time. In Vilnius, these conflicts didn't take such brutal forms as in some provincial towns in Lithuania, when they escalated into physical violence, sometimes even called pogroms in the press. Nevertheless, they were evidence of serious tensions. The fact that Vilnius was part of the Russian Empire had a significant impact on the non-emergence of brutal ethnic conflicts after 1905. After the revolution, ethnic violence or another mass incidents were not numerous in the rest of the Russian Empire as well. The Tsarist regime kept a close eye on public sentiment and made considerable efforts to prevent mass disturbances. On the other hand, the Tsarist regime also had another 
stabilizing function. For most of the more active citizens of the city, with the exception of few Russians, the regime was, as already mentioned, the enemy, which at least until the First World War, reduced the possibility of ethnic conflicts between uh, ethnic groups in the city. However, the absence of ethnic violence and the fact that um, other ethnic tensions have not taken any more violent forms does not mean that there was no potential risk of such conflict. The problem was that all the influential nationalisms that were strong in the city saw Vilnius as part of their national body. For Lithuanians, it was their historical capital and at the same time, the capital of the future nation state, the heart of Lithuania. A small group of nation-minded Belarusians saw the city within the borders of ethnographic Belarus. For the Poles, Vilnius was a city created by Polish culture and civilization, part of Poland, which in Polish discourse was usually seen within the borders of uh, 1772, so Lithuania included. In the Russian discourse, Vilnius was already seen as a Russian or Belarusian national territory. This overlapping of images of once one territory had a very high potential for conflict, especially considering that for Lithuanians, it was the most important part of their national territory. In this sense, the territorial conflict over Vilnius was, as far as I know, quite unique in Central and Eastern Europe, because the problem here was not the peripheries, which various nationalists included in their concepts of national territories, but the core territory. To sum up, the potential for territorial conflict over Vilnius was very high, but it was not inevitable, especially since, as we have seen, pragmatic alliances were sometimes forged between different ethnic groups. I have mentioned a cooperation between Lithuanians and Jews. Lithuanians also cooperated with the Belarusians, who because of the weakness of the national movement during the uh, First World War, gave priority to a common Lithuanian Belarusian state, even accepting that Vilnius should be in the Lithuanian part. However, these alliances were not sustainable, especially given that they were often forged in unity against common enemies. As a hierarchy of enemies change, various marriages of convenience were also threatened. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Violeta Devaliute, Professor Institute of International Relations and Political Science at Vilnius University. She's also C Senior Researcher at the Institute of History and Project Leader of an investigatory and, and research group um, named Facing the Past, Public History for a Stronger Europe. She's the author of many publications. I'll just mention here uh, one of her books, The Making and Breaking of Soviet Lithuania, Memory in Modernity in the Wake of War, published in 2013. Um, her more recent publications include articles titled The Gaze of the Implicated Subject, Non-Jewish Testimony to Communal Violence During the German Occupation of Lithuania, published uh, this year, and coming out, and, and last year, Agonistic Homecomings, Holocaust Post-Memory, Perspective and Locality. Professor Davidovka, please. Can we hear well? Oh, it's working. So, so once again, I would like to start by thanking for being invited to this distinguished panel. And um, it really feels a little bit like coming home because I spent uh, year 2015, from 2015 to 2016 at Yale. And I see Mrs. Ratis Kazitskas with us. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank Kazitskas' family for supporting scholars from Lithuania who come here and do their postdocs and, and can do research. So thank you. It's nice. And I will talk about another kind of uncomfortable fragment of the history of illness. And uh, um, that is really um, 
up for intensive debate at the moment. So that is uh, about uh, Vilnius after the war or the Soviet Vilnius. And this is the topic that is directly and indirectly of concern in Lithuania today. This concern is manifest in discussions about the public spaces in the city, about monuments and memory sites. In other words, debates about what memories should be preserved in the cityscape of Vilnius and what should be pushed aside or erased. This, of course, concerns many other cities and towns over the country, but especially the capital, which is like a forge for casting the contours of the emerging Lithuanian collective identity. This process of recasting the contours of identity, of course, started right after independence, even before, during the time of Perestroika and popular movement or Sayudis. It continued into the next century with Lithuania's accession to the EU in 2004 and gained, gained a new urgency after 2014 with Russia's aggression against Ukraine and especially since February 2022. So today, Lithuanians are experiencing what has been called vicarious identification with Ukraine and also what Estonian scholar Maria Maltsu has called a post-colonial moment of sorts. So what is this post-colonial moment? Well, these debates touch key issues like the legacy of for foreign occupation, the forms and the scope of collaboration with foreign occupiers, the significance of accommodation and judgments about individuals as heroes or cowards. In other words, it's a discussion about who we are and it's a debate among Lithuanians um, talking about Lithuanians and their role in history. I will return to this post-colonial moment in my conclusions, but first I would like to address the history of Vilnius very briefly during the war and its aftermath, because to talk about the history of Soviet Vilnius after the war is actually impossible without kind of glancing at what happened to Vilnius during World War II. Vilnius emerged from the Second World War as the site of herbicide, a term used by Karl Schlegel to describe the destruction of the people, customs, and heritage of urban communities across East Central Europe. It describes the process by which ethnic groups who lived in urban centers were killed or displaced by transfers of the populations, clearing space for a post-war influx of people belonging to ethnic groups that traditionally lived in the countryside. Lithuania lost one-fifth of, of its population during the Second World War, but this loss was divided unevenly between the town and the country. The population of the cities, um, mostly Poles and Jews, but also other ethnicities, was cut in half, while the rural population, mostly ethnic Lithuanians, was reduced by less than one-tenth. Right after the war, about 170,000 Poles were displaced hundreds of kilometers to the west in the new borders of communist Poland. Um, how did this affect Vilnius? Well, before the war, the population of Vilnius was over 200,000. By 1945, this number was cut roughly in half. And so when thinking about this drastic depopulation of Vilnius during this period, we must bear in mind that this process was eagerly exploited by the occupational regimes, by Nazi and Soviet propaganda. So if one opens, if you open a newspaper published in Vilnius in 1941 or 1942, for example, Noyori Lietuva, you will find articles and poems on how the arrival of German rule had cleansed the capital of quote-unquote Jewish filth, paving the way for Lithuanian workers and merchants. You would find this article at articles. This is basically um, in every daily, um, in every issue of, of this, and you know, this daily and, and other uh, published press. Um, if you open a newspaper published in 1947, you will find articles and poems of how arrival of Soviet rule had cleansed the capital of the Polish landlords and clergy, um, making Soviet people and Lithuanians the former tenants masters of their own home. Notably, these articles and poems 
were written um, in Lithuanian and by Lithuanians who collaborated with the occupational regimes for one reason or another. And of course, these were propagandistic narratives. These were lies. Um, in the USSR, Lithuanians were anything but masters of their home. Nevertheless, the narrative of making Vilnius Lithuanian was powerful, it is prominent, and it in a way showed continuity in, you know, with kind of narrative con continuity uh, with the campaign of the interwar period of Lithuanian independence uh, to retake Vilnius from Polish occupation. So after the war, the depopulated cities were to be filled with new arrivals. A small number of bureaucrats um, and uh, professionals um, had moved from the, to the new capital from Konas, another city that served as a temporary capital during the interwar period. You, I'm sure you know that. Many more officials, engineers, workers, and soldiers, um, mother people came in from Moscow, the other Soviet republics, um, and other places. The regime desperately lacked resources, workers, professionals, administrators, and especially cultural elites, art architects, filmmakers, painters, writers, who would help to preach Soviet ideals and promote the Soviet state. Stalin famously called writers engineers of human souls, adding that the production of souls is more important than the production of tanks. And this was not mere turn of phrase, but fundamental to the practice of post-war reconstruction. So the authorities after the war launched an intensive campaign to attract people to the capital. Um, and the prime target of this mobilization campaign was the youth. Relocation to the city, um, and this is not only the story of Vilnius, actually the story of Klaipeda and, and other urban centers, but Vilnius is especially prominent in this context, uh, was presented as the road to the bright future, but also was narrated as patriotic activity. Um, so um, initially, this had little success, as Lithuanian historian Vitalia Strabinskine showed in her work. But gradually, from late 1940s, oh, onwards, the flow of young Lithuanians from the countryside um, started, started moving to Vilnius. They came to Vilnius, uh, as Professor Thomas Venslova put in his memoirs very aptly, carrying with them, quote, gloomy memories of the post-war resistance. Indeed, the story of their arrival is told in many memoirs and biographies, and I will rely here on the account of the famous uh, Lithuanian poet and writer, Marcellus Martinaitis, uh, who in 2007 wrote a remarkable piece about his arrival in Vilnius. The piece is called Vilnius Village of Mine. And I quote, after the war, we were traveling to the city in lorries decorated with the branches of birch trees, singing loudly, we will rebuild the city of Gediminas. We were traveling to a lost and romanticized place, which we knew only from the interwar postal stamps and associated it with the image of the tricolor on the castle of Gediminas, which we drew at school. This was part of this Vilnius campaign. It was widely, um, widely present, you know, in, in kind of in the curriculum to motivate kids to regain the capital, to make it Lithuanian again. And then Martinaitis continues, when we arrived in Vilnius after the war, one could hardly see any of those elderly ladies dressed in old style garments, typical for the old city quarters or old gentlemen with a stick and a dog, nuns, antique stores or Jewish people selling their poverty. There were still signs in various language showing through the soot or the plaster on the walls. Those who moved to the city had no idea in whose apartments they lived. Who were the owners? Where did they go? Ultimately, they had no idea what a city is, especially the one that is to serve as the capital." End quote. 
indeed, the new arrivals left behind not only their villages and farmsteads, but also the trauma they witnessed in the countryside. The trauma was connected not only with the post-war anti-Soviet insurgency, but also with the violence of the Holocaust, which they witnessed in the, their native locations as children. For many years, after many years, sorry, Martinitis and other um, members of the generation would provide oral testimony, in this case, Marcellus Martinitis, to how he, as a small child living in a village near the town of Raseni, saw an undressed man covered in blood. Many others testified to the violence they witnessed in the, their native villages um, or towns and the violence of anti-Soviet partisans being laid out in the square church, you know, in the central square of the place and so on. Memories that were repressed for many years. I will use the citation uh, by another, from another writing of another um, um, uh, representative of this generation of after-war arrival, Alphonsus Maldonis. He describes his departure from his native village in the following words, and I quote, the night before I left, I climbed up the hill and looked around. Fires were burning everywhere. The first harvest of the coal horse farms had been set alight. I gazed for hours at the northern lights, tinged with red, and listened to the sporadic machine gun fire. This is how I left my village. So, but still, this generation of Lithuanians who came to the city and entered universities or other schools of higher education, Soviet higher education, they were on the winning side of history and in their memoirs and their accounts, this is clearly felt. They would be the first of their families very frequently to get higher education or to benefit from the drive of the authorities to foster the development of the urban elites. And so the task of rebuilding Vilnius and culture textually um, was kind of entrusted to them, but went hand in hand with the Sovietization drive. And so um, destalinization amplified the role of cultural intelligentsia even more, uh, and it was tasked with generating grassroots enthusiasm for the building of the Soviet state. Of course, the role of the creative elites in the shaping of identity transcends the context of the former USSR. In a famous study of colonialism called the Lettered City, uh, the Latin American um, uh, critic Angel Rama highlights the role of cities in propagating the culture of the metropolis in the periphery. He also highlights the role of the lettered elites or letrados in constructing the city in discourse. In Lithuania, under late socialism, this new generation of educated youth would assume the, the role of uh, the letrados. I use this term foreign to the Lithuanian and East Central European uh, context to highlight the hybrid colonial role that they played as cogs in the wheel of the Soviet propaganda machine, but also as writers with a sense of their own, or creators uh, with a sense of their own agency. They were expected to modernize Soviet Lithuanian culture, to bring it up to world level, to make Lithuania into a showcase of Soviet modernity. At the same time, they were preoccupied with the individual and collective experience of the post-war era. In their works, paradoxically, they documented uh, the transformation of Lithuanian society from rural to urban, um, or large segment of Lithuanian society, I have to say, and gave a voice to the generation of Lithuanians who lived through it, um, through this period with them. So their works are seldom considered to be the works of urban literature because the urbanity they portrayed was transitional. They wrote the text of the city by narrating the past passage of a protagonist from the country to the city and the mentality of a person who is half village um, and half city or the cityscape as 
permeated with elements of rusticity. So in this way, they articulated Vilnius as a kind of borderline between the countryside or this different kind of civilizational milieu and the urban and the urban texture, the urban way or urban way of being. Against this background of traumatic forced transformation, it would take some time before Lithuanian culture actually would catch up with demographic change um, in its, in its rep, you know, representative power and their representation. Reflecting on their collective aspirations to write the text of the city, Martinaitis recalls, and I quote again, one cannot become an urbanite right away. Uh, it was only after our children grew up in Vilnius that our generation started to write about the city, to read the memoirs of the old residents of Vilnius, to look up family names, drawings, photos, old city plans, street names, and the sites of old estates, churches, and fortifications, end quote. In other words, the generation of newcomers to Vilnius, uh, the Letrados, who were meant to serve as mere cogs in the wheel of Soviet propaganda had an agency of their own. This agency was not pure. The experience is highly ambiguous, but this was also the experience of the generation of Lithuanians who made Vilnius into the city as it is today. And so in conclusion, I would like to come back to this question of anti-Soviet iconoplasm in Lithuania. Um, with the onset of Glasnost, Sayudis, Perestroika, some members of this generation stepped forward as iconic personalities of the popular movement. The words were appealing for the population. They were mobilizing the populace against Soviet rule with their speeches and essays. They had the authority. Um, now, for some time, and I have to add, they quite literally shaped the self-conception of many Lithuanians writ large. Since then, however, um, especially since 2014, as I said, Russia's aggression and historical revisionism has catalyzed a powerful movement to uh, not only reflect this intensely, but also reject um, everything associated with the Soviet period. Um, so here, to conclusion, I would like to say the following. Scholars of decolonization, like Anne Rigney, have argued that iconoplasm can play a progressive role in so far as the confrontation with the intolerable presence of the old um, offers a, quote, tangible focus for making change in the politics of visibility. But if pushed too far, iconoplasm may become an end of itself. And um, let us hope that this wave that is starting now will not um, kind of preclude us the reflection and understanding that um, our history did not kind of was made of the acts of heroes and martyrs, but really bring in all the complexity also including you know, social aspects, social history, and that will stimulate the debate and will kind of teach reflection about the valuable lesson or continue teaching reflections <laughs> about the valuable history of the lessons, sorry, of the 20th century. Thank you, Professor W. Liute. Now we only have a few minutes left according to the schedule. We have written into the schedule, though, a, a break here because we still have today another panel and then music and then reception. So we'll be running from place to place after this break. So, so we really wanted to give you that break. But if, I'll decide here. I'll just, we'll take a couple minutes, a couple minutes for, for, for questions. Mm -hmm. um, while you're th and we won't be able we'll, so please please think of your very best questions and make them very very brief uh i would just ask the um, the speakers in reflection of professor Vinslova's remark in his uh in his uh speaking to us here this morning he mentioned that the vilnius text is a mythic world 
of eternal cycles as opposed to history. The Vilnius text, now, now Vilnius itself doesn't write about itself. Cities don't write their own narratives. It, it's people who write the narratives. Uh, Violetta, in your remarks, one of your writers said, and I hope I have this, this right, it was only when we moved to Vilnius that we could write about it. So my question to uh, the panelists is, is there one Vilnius or are there multiple Vilniuses? <laughs> just uh, just uh, the answer is a little bit difficult because it is yes and no. Uh, yes, there is uh, there, there are multiple Vilniuses, including various ethnic narratives, which are very often uh, opposed to to each other, but taken together they somehow coalesce into one um, great picture. Mm, but maybe mm, some other speakers would mm, tell more about that. I, th I think these presentations kind of show that there are multiple images of Vilnius and they're very often kind of feed off each other or are in tension with each other or polemicize with each other. But as Professor Vanslova said, in a way, it kind of really, it, it's, it's um, yeah, that's what the texture of this city is. You know, it's, it's impossible to uh, understand what Vilnius is without taking these different narratives, visions, ambitions, even ideological projects, right, into consideration. My answer would be maybe Darius would like to. Actually, I don't know. I, I think it's uh, a very complicated uh, question, uh, but uh, it depends uh, on on many things. Uh, and uh, for what I know, it's more about many pictures, many narratives, and not the one one, not just the one. That, that you have uh, about this uh, this city, but it it depends on the topic also. Maybe I, I'll stop here. Okay, please. Uh, we will have uh, time for several questions. Please. Uh, please have uh, I think you oh, should speak into the mic. Um, so I apologize in advance for uh, posing a contemporary question to the panel that's predominated with historians. But I was wondering, how would you approach the dialectic or maybe just a relationship between claiming history and uh, sharing, sharing one? Because I think we can all, from all of your remarks, it was obvious that Vilnius and Lithuania is sharing history with many other people. And what is what even is Lithuania? What are Lithuanian history? And I think uh, since the independence, we have seen that Lithuania has managed to consolidate an identity, consolidate a myth, consolidate the national history. But I think from every 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 five years or so, we encounter these discussions about now it's Litvinism, back in the day it was Vilnius. Um, and all these different moments where Lithuania is confronted with the fact that maybe the history is shared and how we should approach that. So my question would be how you as historians and people who looked into this history, how could you advise the current Lithuania to, um, to develop this relationship of sharing the history that it cherishes?
I don't think there's a, one answer uh, to this, but um, you know, as Lenin would say, maybe I'm just a, a rotten liberal um, wanting it always. But I do think that the thing is that history hi history is something that's often taught in school, and that's why everyone says I hate history. Um, but by the time we're adults, I think that it is necessary to go beyond these easy narratives. And I don't think that argument and conversation, and I, I guess I am really an old fashioned liberal because I really think that argument and conversation is possible without us slitting each other's throats, um, despite all the, uh, uh, the uh, evidence to the contrary in this country and elsewhere. Um, but I think that that's, that's what makes us uh, remember. I mean, the Jews are a part of Lithuanian history. The Poles are a part of the Lithuanian history, um, and Vilnius cannot be to uh, taught, uh, cannot be uh, described in one sort of heroic, uh, ethnic, or one political line. It has to be, um, it has to be kind of a, a symphony back and forth. Uh, and I, um, you know, I think that that's what makes it really much more interesting, um, um, and also is a it's a living thing that. Um, you know, uh, needs to be constantly uh, revised and um, and added to and uh, yeah uh, argued about. So, Vita, uh, what can people do? I would just have a practical response, and that is, people in the Baltic region are forgetting the languages of their homeland. I've been told by multiple Estonian historians that they have a serious problem in teaching students who themselves are becoming history teachers, that the future history teachers don't speak Russian, lang a language that is needed to understand 20th century, the, the entire imperial history, imperial Russian uh, period, and they don't speak German. So. It, for, for them, this is it's, it's almost like an extent, existential problem. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the, 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 the multiplicity of spaces. Uh, Professor Weeks was very eloquent about that. That well, the, the multiplicity of, of, of architecture in the different places. You can't understand these places without understanding the people that were there, and you need their languages. So that would be my, uh, that would be my advice. Uh, with Vice Mayor Bialuna, we were uh, we were talking about this beforehand. the the need The need to be multilingual. These are multilingual places, and if we're going to be citizens of Riga, of Vilnius, of Kaunas, of Tartu, of Tallinn, Reval, we we need to speak the languages of its of its residents. And I would, I would just add, so when I am, a, I am beginning to write about the history of Lithuania myself, my, my own background is more in Estonian history. Um, and the first thing I'm writing has to do with the first time I spent time in Lithuania. Uh, that was in December 1990. And when I was there, I spoke Russian. So that's the language that I used. Um, and I, it, made it, it made it possible for me to understand something that was going on. But now that I'm spending more and more time in Lithuania, I am studying Lithuania. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the question, uh, for the questions, and uh, we got a, a nearly a 10, a nearly 20 minute break, and then we will have our second panel beginning at 4.30. Thank you very much.